So Ernest Rutherford was actually born in New Zealand. He's a famous, one of the most famous New Zealanders in history, I suppose. I'm not sure I can name another famous New Zealander. I don't know what they're famous for other than uh, right racing in the America's Cup, perhaps, um, and being near Australia. But that's about all I know. He's very famous in New Zealand to the, to the, to the uh, stage that he's actually on a lot of their currency. Um, so he's a pretty important, pretty important figure. He worked as a student of Thompson's at the Cavendish Labs. So he actually wound up there in Britain as well, studying under Thompson as a student of his. And so we can imagine that much like back in ancient times uh, with Aristotle and Democritus, that Thompson would have shared his understanding of the atom and the, and the plum pudding model with Rutherford. Excuse me. He would have shared his understanding of the atom as being like plum pudding, or as we said, chocolate chip cookie dough with, uh, with Rutherford and uh, passed along that information. And so Rutherford, as a student of his, would have had that belief too and hopefully tried to improve upon it or test it and retest it and retest it. You can see here the dates put him in the early, early 1900s. So within about 15 years or so of Thompson uh, comes Rutherford, a slightly uh, more recent guy, a little bit younger in time than, than Thompson. Now Rutherford's famous for something called the gold foil experiment. And it looks a bit like this. The gold foil experiment consists of, as you can see in the middle here, a piece of gold foil. It's got a ring around it, which is labeled here as a fluorescent screen. And then you can see off to the bottom left, that there's a box. It's labeled having a lead shield. So the box is like a, a shield of lead, a box of lead. And if you remember from having x-rays in your life, perhaps, x-rays are, are given where on, say, your leg or your arm. They cover the nearby parts of your body with a big, heavy sort of apron or blanket that's uh, made, got lead lining in it because it protects the rest of your body from x-rays. Well, in this case, the lead shield is keeping the alpha particles, which are a type of weak radiation, from shooting out everywhere and helping to direct them in a very specific place. You can see in this picture that there's a red beam coming out of the, of the uh, lead shielded box. That box would be called an alpha particle gun, if you will. And the, the, uh, instead of shooting bullets like a gun would, this alpha particle gun is shooting out alpha particles. Those are the bullets um, that come out of it. And they're being shot at that gold foil chunk. Rutherford actually didn't do the gold foil experiment, but he's credited with it because he interpreted it. Two guys by the name of Geiger and Marsden were doing the experiment, but couldn't quite figure out why the results were what they were. And Rutherford helped them to interpret it, and so he gets sort of the credit for it, which I guess is sort of fair as well. But we want to mention Geiger and Marsden on this too, because if they hadn't done the experiment, he wouldn't have had a whole lot to interpret. So, since this is plum pudding stage of our understanding, it would have been natural to assume that the gold foil in that sheet would be made of plum pudding atoms. So that gold foil, very thin, very, very thin layer of gold foil, would be made of plum pudding atoms. And in those atoms would be many little negative electrons surrounded by a positive field that was evenly spread through the rest of the pudding, or the dough, as we called it in our chocolate chip cookie dough model. And what they would have assumed then is that since the alpha particles were shooting at that thin sheet of gold, that there wouldn't be a whole lot about that gold foil in the plum pudding that could do a lot of anything to, to uh, stop the alpha particles from going straight through. But there's something you need to understand about alpha particles before we go on and talk about why this, gold, why this gold foil experiment is so important. And that is that alpha particles are positively charged. Now, alpha particles are very common, understood, uh, commonly understood today as a very simple part, or simple type, rather, of radiation. They're rather weak one. In fact, you're bombarded with alpha particle radiation on a daily basis. It's not the kind that turns you into Spider-Man or the Incredible Hulk or anything cool like that, which I guess is good. Uh, alpha particle radiation is fairly weak. It is a type of radiation, uh, but it's not like being bombarded by gamma rays from the sun or even x-rays, certainly, uh, or even microwaves. Uh, pretty, pretty common. It passes, uh, we would believe, straight on through this gold foil and not do a darn thing um, as it does. So alpha particles being positive, we're going to shoot them at this gold foil and we expect that they'll go straight on through because there's really nothing there to block them, nothing there to stop them from passing on through. And so if you see in this picture then, what they expected would be that the particles would pass through and be detected in one place. Now again, notice that fluorescent screen, you can't see an alpha particle gun ray. We see a red beam here as if it's a laser pointer. 
but alpha particles are invisible. And so as you turn on an alpha particle gun, you can't see uh, the particles shooting out of it as a laser pointer would be. You can only detect where they land. And that's an important understanding here too. So that's why the fluorescent screen is wrapped around the outside so that where those particles land, we can see a little blip or a little beam of light sort of show up as a spot on that fluorescent screen. And you can see here that they're predicting, or uh, Rutherford would have expected, that all the points, um, or rather all the alpha particles, would land in this one little spot straight through on the opposite side of the gold foil and make a single and very bright dot right there on the fluorescent screen. Now, of course, that we're building up to the fact that this is what uh, was expected, and uh, going on about that, you might assume then that that's not what happened, and you'd be right. So when they did the shooting, most of the particles actually did go straight through. Uh, you see here there's a slightly thicker red beam going straight on through the foil. Uh, but what actually happened then was that as they turn that on, let it expose for a while or shoot for a while, and then shut it off and looked at the screen and sort of developed it like a film, more or less, uh, we could think about it as showing up many little blips along here, a main dot much more significant than the others, and then many, many other little detections all around the outside in funny places where they would not have expected to see anything. Why the odd angles? This was unusual. I always like to imagine that Rutherford would have been looking at the results of this. Geiger and Marsden or Rutherford would have looked at the examples of this and Rutherford would have been shocked. Reason being, there's nothing about the gold foil uh, and, the, and the idea of a plum pudding model that should have those particles shooting off in weird places. They should pass right through the pudding without any trouble at all. And I can imagine then Rutherford with some d disbelief calling Thompson at home uh, in order to tell him about it and saying, hey buddy, we got trouble here. Uh, something's not right with that plum pudding model after all. So the plum pudding model, see here again, the old model we had a few slides ago and on the last uh, description with Thompson. These little beams would go straight on through and here the arrows are showing how the alpha particles would pass straight through. There's nothing about that plum pudding model, that blue sphere with yellow electrons in it, if you will. There's nothing that's different from top to bottom. It's just cookie dough all the way through, right? And so there's nothing to think that the alpha particles, again, the arrows here are the alpha particles, nothing to think that they wouldn't just go straight on through that guy, um, pass through the other side um, without any trouble at all. Turns out that that's not quite right. The Rutherford model redrew the atom significantly different. And it's shown here as simply a positive center, very tiny positive center, and then a big cloud all around it. And in that big cloud is where those electrons or those corpuscles of Thompson would be found. Now why does the Rutherford model make more sense? And why does the Rutherford model explain what he saw with the gold foil experiment? Well let's look at those conclusions and see why his drawing makes more sense and is actually a lot closer to what we think of today. First of all, the atom, according to Rutherford's experiment, was mostly empty space. Why? Well, most of the particles, again, went straight on through. And you can see here in the diagram that a lot of the arrows do pass right on through the atom without any trouble at all. But some didn't. So statistically, how many were going through? Well, Rutherford's experiment showed, you know, all but maybe one in a million going straight past and on through. But it was those strange few that didn't go straight through that, that, that gave him reason to, to refine the model of the atom. Plum pudding couldn't explain why one in a million alpha particles would come shooting off at some funny angle. And so the plum pudding model, even though it worked for all but one in a million, wasn't good enough. So he redrew the atom as being mostly empty space. Now in our drawing here, as our sphere is drawn here in green, that green cloud or that green sort of area that makes up most of the atom is essentially empty space, kind of a big open, uh, open area in the sphere. And he believed, or his theory was, that the positive charge of the atom is not in a dough or a pudding that's evenly spread throughout the entire atom. He believed that the positive charge of the, of the atom was concentrated in a very tiny central nucleus. Now, again, because so many particles went straight through and only some were deflected. You gotta think back in your head here. A moment ago I told you that alpha particles are positively charged. And so if alpha particles are positive, then it would stand a reason that it would take something else positive to make them turn or be deflected or we could say repelled uh, within the atom. So Thompson's, or rather, I'm sorry, Rutherford's idea was that those positive alpha particles 
were coming uh, straight into the atom and if they got too close to this positive center of the atom then the positive alpha particles would feel kind of a repulsion it's as if you're putting two norths together on a magnets on two magnets and they push each other invisibly we can't see that repulsion but we can feel it that's one of the coolest things i think in all of really introductory elementary science that we don't really give enough time to that two north poles on two magnets will push each other invisibly apart and the same with two south poles it's a phenomenal feeling that's really hard to even match with anything else um, it's giving us amazing things like magnetic levitation and all sorts of other things uh, but the feeling of two north north to north magnets pushing on each other is just awesome well that's the same kind of idea that rutherford has here that an alpha particle coming in and a positive nucleus would feel that same repulsion and being that the positive nucleus is a lot heavier and a tiny little bullet sized alpha particle then just teeny tiny little speck would come in it would feel the repulsion of that positive nucleus and instead of hitting it it would steer itself off at a funny angle and go off at a, at a goofy angle like you see here um, on the Rutherford model picture if it hits straight on it came in straight on it might even sort of put the brakes on and head back the other way and that was how he explained or he theorized the idea of why some of the particles were going off in funny goofy angles most though were going straight on through and again those are the ones that weren't getting close enough to the nucleus to feel its effects the rest of his conclusions the nucleus he said had to be very heavy and dense and again it's because as those alpha particles came in if this nucleus isn't really strong and heavy then the alpha particle could make that be repelled instead but as it is this is a big heavy nucleus in something like gold a big heavy nucleus and that tiny little alpha particle comes in and it is deflected while this big heavy nucleus stays exactly in one place which is actually not too far off um, an atom an atom like gold has a very heavy nucleus compared to a little alpha particle though rutherford didn't know that at the time and lastly there's electrons now if we did the gold foil experiment and then we went back and did the cathode ray tube experiment we still have to be able to explain where those electrons would be where are thompson's corpuscles after all this they're still there we can't just forget about that those electrons are still there and they're kind of more or less still like they were before spread out throughout the entire atom um, randomly around that center nucleus so the big change is not that electrons are all that much different they're still behaving the same way we want to put those in the atom though uh, around the nucleus and so they're going to be in this large green spherical area occupying around that nucleus then and taking up most of the space of the atom they're sort of randomly spread in a cloud around the nucleus not too much different than before actually and if we put the cathode ray tube back to work we could get those electrons to pop out of there just like before and jump across the gap and uh, wouldn't it be anything different about those it's just now we have to be able to explain not only the cathode ray tube experiment but now we have to be able to account for what we just saw with the gold foil experiment too I'm gonna mention now a quote that I really like um, and it comes from uh, comes from uh, Sir Isaac Newton and his quote is that if I have seen further it is by standing on the shoulders of giants I love this quote if I have seen further it is by standing on the shoulders of giants the idea with Newton there is that um, it doesn't necessarily uh, stand on, on my own work that I can go further or see further than someone uh, who came before me in fact Newton was giving credit to the people uh, who came before him and he gets a lot of press we think about Newton as being very important to physics and certainly he is but he was sort of being humble at the same time um, giving credit to people who came before him Rutherford saw further than Thompson but he only had the power to see further because Thompson had taught him so much and so he stood uh, metaphorically on Thompson's shoulders in order to see a bit further see a bit more truth about the atom and Thompson would say that he stood on Dalton's shoulders Dalton would stay, say that he should stood on, on, on the shoulders of Proust and Lavoisier and they stood on Democritus's shoulders so you can imagine that we're stacking people taller and taller and able to see further and further well it turns out Rutherford's not the end of the of the chain either and we'll take it a bit further from Rutherford as we go the last little bit I do want to give you about Rutherford though uh, is it to help us tie off the last of the subatomic particles and the electron was the first of the subatomic particles to be discovered subatomic meaning not below the atom but smaller in size than the atom so smaller in size subatomic below the size of the atom particles and the electron was the first one so Rutherford's idea uh, with the uh, atom 
gave us the nucleus, but he didn't give us the proton, in fact, um, which is part of that nucleus, and we'll talk more about that as we go through the year as well. A hundred years or so before Rutherford, in fact, there was someone who'd, who'd had the idea that atoms were built out of hydrogen atoms, that hydrogen atoms were the building block for all matter. It's a very insightful idea because when you study sort of things like stellar evolution and how stars have, have, uh, have grown and how stars work and how uh, the universe and, and different galaxies and planets like ourselves formed from, from uh, out of the Big Bang, uh, that, that hydrogen atoms were, in fact, the building blocks of all matter. It's not quite that simple in chemistry, we know better now, but hydrogen atoms sort of are the smallest of all. And he called those hydrogen atoms protiles, gave each of them a mass of one unit, and that's not far off at all from what hydrogens actually are today. So he gave us the idea that there were particles there that were small. Um, it turns out that when Rutherford did further experimentation with alpha particles, he could shoot alpha particles at hydrogen atoms, at hydrogen gas, and he could make a positively charged piece pop out of the hydrogen atoms. He then was finding, in sort of a way, that little smaller piece uh, that was inside of a hydrogen atom even, uh, that positive, positively charged piece, and so the counterpart to the electron was being discovered. And he called it, Rutherford named it the proton, in sort of honor, actually, of William Prout's original word, the protile. He considered calling it the proton for a while, but uh, people at the time convinced him otherwise, and they stuck with the prefix pro, which you see in a lot of things as sort of being like in prokaryotes, the precursor, um, or the early stage of, of something in development is often pro something. And so with proton, it's that early stage piece that, uh, that other things are built from. And so Rutherford discovers the proton, uh, which was sort of theorized by someone who'd come before him, again, standing on the shoulders of giants. The problem then was that when we look at the mass of an atom, um, the size of that atom or the mass of that atom was not just coming from the protons. There was something else that had mass that they couldn't quite figure out where it was coming from. It was sort of an invisible uh, mass that was being added to atoms. It wasn't just the protons that were adding up to that total mass. Something else had to be there too. But they couldn't get it to show its face, if you will. And that neutron was the piece that was left. It wouldn't be for quite a while later that we would discover the neutron because it was sort of invisible. Neutron, of course, being neutral, has no charge. It's very difficult to detect a neutron because it doesn't uh, register in the same way as something with a positive or a negative charge can. Like we can get them to show up with detectors, uh, with, with electricity being sort of one of the after effects or one of the uh, repercussions of the whole idea of electrons in the first place. Neutrons don't have a real obvious sort of signature like that, so it was difficult to find them, and they wouldn't be find, found rather for a little bit a little bit later. Uh, Rutherford uh, did further experiments as well as a guy by the name of James Chadwick, and there were others. Eventually, a neutral particle came to be uh, that neutron, and it also, like the proton, had a mass of one unit. Now we won't go into the experiments that gave us that, just like we kind of skipped over the proton discovery experiment. Uh, just suffice it to say that it took other people, again, other people standing on the shoulders of those people who came before them to get a good understanding uh, for what the atom was built of. So now we've talked a bit about the electron, most about the electron, and then the nucleus through the gold foil experiment. We've d touched briefly now on how the proton came about and the neutron. Rutherford was a big character, no doubt, a big part of why he's so famous back in New Zealand. He did a lot to contribute to the world of chemistry, which led to a bigger understanding of the world of biology, and it kept on going from there. So if he's the only famous Kiwi that we know from New Zealand, uh, he was a darn important one, and he's plenty good enough uh, to represent the country well. So that's all we've got for today. Uh, we'll cut it off there, and we'll come back and talk more about the people who came after Rutherford as we go on further.